During the first uh, part of 2024, uh, Pastor Hammond has been leading our church through the book of First Peter, and the theme that, uh, that Pastor Chip has been challenging us with is this theme of exile, and specifically, we've been considering how we are, in fact, an exiled people, a people in exile. And while this week and uh, next week we're going to step away from our, examine of the, our examination of the book of 1 Peter while Pastor Hammond is on study break, uh, this week at least we're going to continue to think about what it means to be an exiled people. Uh, but this week we're going to do so by considering the words of Jesus from the Ga- Gospel of Matthew. Because for all the reasons that, we, that have been made clear to us already in our study this year, we are a people in exile. This is a reality. But another reality is that our experience in exile is much different from the experience of other Christian communities who likewise have gone through other periods of exile. Because the truth is, generally speaking, we're a pretty comfortable people. Our experience today in Northern Virginia and and in communities that are similar to ours is certainly different from the experience of other Christians who are elsewhere in the world, and I would encourage you to talk to our brother Brian Lynch about some of those communities who are struggling and are in need of our prayer and of our support. But our current exile is also different and distinct from the experiences that we read about throughout the biblical history. Our condition is different from that uh, of the of the first readers of of, uh, uh, Peter's letter uh, when he wrote it in the first century to to Christians throughout the Greco-Roman Empire who were facing their own uh, unique type of persecutions and unique types of challenges. Our experience is different than theirs. And certainly, too, our experience today is distinct from that of the exiled Israelites who were displaced from the kingdom of Judah to Babylon in the 6th century B.C., About 20 years ago, I had the opportunity to visit uh, the site of the ancient ruins of Babylon, and it was a fascinating experience. Babylon is located in what's uh, what's commonly referred to as the Fertile Crescent area of central southern Iraq. It's near the the modern-day city of Hilla, Iraq. Uh, And in this part of Iraq, uh, going back centuries, the most manageable area for living, for people to, to live and to cultivate lands, is the area between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And indeed, the Euphrates River passes right through uh, what used to be the the boundaries of the ancient city of Babylon. Now, these days, uh, today, Babylon is a mix of preserved ruins uh, dating back to the periods even before the, uh, the uh, the exile of the Israelites to Babylon. Uh, but it also has restored and recreated section, and, and the government of Iraq has gone to pretty great lengths uh, to restore and rebuild certain areas of the ancient uh, city of Babylon, and they tried to do it to specification. And the, and the neat thing, actually, is that in many cases, they've tried to use the bricks and mortar and rubble and debris from the original ancient ruins to rebuild and recreate things like the, uh, the great city walls, the Ishtar Gate, the amphitheater, And so it was fun and it was fascinating uh, to walk around the ruins and imagine what the great city of Babylon would have been like in its heyday. It was fun to imagine the bustling Mesopotamian metropolis filled with people and possibly even home to those famed hanging gardens of Babylon. But like so many other city-states of the time, life for those at the top of the food chain was, was pretty good. But for those at the bottom, which would have included the exiled Israelites, life was much, much more difficult. Babylon is in a difficult area, and the Babylonians were a complicated people. Life as an exile in Babylon was not easy. And while things may have evolved for the exiled Israelites from the first generation exiles to the second and then to the third, things may have evolved over time, but it's safe to say that their experience as an exiled people is different from ours today. And one of the main things that differentiate their experience from ours is that we are, generally speaking, a pretty comfortable people. By God's grace, we're generally comfortable. Now, comfort in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing, but unchecked comfort over long periods of time almost always results in self-entitlement, and spiritual laziness. Why? Because it's hard to focus on the things that you need 
when you have everything that you want. And friends, that is what has happened in many American evangelical circles even today. What began in American evangelicalism as an attitude of gratitude for God who, has, who had obtained for them freedom and comfort over time became an attitude of deservedness. Then that attitude of deservedness became an attitude of entitlement in that the church began to believe that, that she was entitled to the comforts and freedoms that American society provided. And then to complete the transition from gratitude to self-importance, the American church paved way for the prosperity gospel movement, which preached that comfort was no longer a gift from God, but a gift from the church herself. Prosperity gospel preachers claim that God has gifted them with the unique power and authority to bestow blessings, and that, that all people uh, in, in the country and around the world have the opportunity to earn God's special blessing of comfort by adhering to the messages proclaimed by unfit and godless preachers. But apart from them, there are other churches that face these types of struggles as well. There are other churches who, in their attempt to remain relatable and relevant, will borrow from the world to try to bridge the gap between holiness and worldliness. So how did the church get there? How did we get there? What was it that the church did? What was it that we did? And what was it that we forgot that allowed the sin of spiritual laziness and allowed the sin of clinging to comfort to become so pervasive in some of our worship communities? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus when we are both an exiled people? Yes, this is true, but we're also a comfortable people because this is also true. With that in mind, let's read together from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, starting at verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that He must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And Peter took Him aside and began to rebuke Him. Never, Lord, He said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. And Father, this morning as we read this familiar passage, we humbly pray for hearing ears and attentive hearts so that we too can be transformed by the truth of Your Word. Amen. So what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Uh, C.S. Lewis tells a story of suffering from, uh, from chronic toothaches when he was a child. And he, he knew that if he told his mother about them, uh, his mother, dear saint that she was, would give Lewis something that would deaden the pain and allow him to sleep through the night. But Lewis explains that more often than not, he would avoid going to his mother with a complaint about his toothache, and, and, and he explains why. He says, the reason I did not go was this. I had no doubt she would give me an aspirin, but I knew she would also do something else. I knew she would take me to the dentist the next morning. I could not get out of her what I wanted without getting something more, which I did not want. I wanted immediate relief from my pain, but I could not get it without having my teeth set permanently right. And Lewis uses this illustration to describe the thing that so many people have encountered when thinking about and considering Christianity. People want relief from the perils of the world, but they still want to be able to do the things that bring them joy and pleasure and comfort without question. They want refuge from their suffering, but they don't want to have to change everything about themselves. 
And when it comes to the very, the very person of Jesus, they, they imagine and want some kind of you got a friend in me, Savior guru, but they don't want a long-suffering Savior who requires a person to die to themselves in order to follow Him. They want a good and merciful God, but they want one that's outgrown some of that pesky Old Testament wrath stuff. Some will even go so far as to proclaim that they want to give their lives to Jesus Christ, but there are just a couple things they want to do before they do it. And for them, for people like that, perhaps they pray a, a prayer similar to that of a very young St. Augustine when he prayed to the, uh, out loud to God, Lord, make me holy, just not yet. The words of Jesus that we find here in Matthew remind us that being a follower of Christ simply doesn't work that way. Disciples of Jesus can't pick and choose the aspects of Christianity that, that bring relief and comfort and then to disregard the things that they find unsettling. Following Jesus is an all-in event, and it's going to require sacrifice and denying oneself the things of the world. And the, and the, path, that, uh, the path of Christ is one that He Himself trailblazes through His own self-denial and through His own self-sacrifice. And learning this was something that was, that was difficult uh, for the disciples and, and difficult in particular for Peter. Jesus said that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers, and that ultimately he would be killed. And to this, Peter responds by pulling Jesus aside and rebuking him, saying that Jesus was not destined, in fact, to suffer these things. And for the, for the purposes of, of learning and understanding, we can, we can translate uh, the word rebuke, uh, the Greek word that's used for rebuke here, we can understand it in a couple other ways so that we can uh, fully comprehend what Peter was doing at that moment. He was admonishing Jesus. He was trying to forbid the content of what Jesus was saying. He was challenging that the Lord had it wrong. Surely you, Peter said, will not suffer these things. Now, yeah, without question, such a direct and stark challenge to something said by Jesus Christ himself is at a minimum ill-advised. And I think it's easy for us as students of the Word today uh, to read this account and to be very critical of how Peter responds, but I'd like you for a moment to put yourself in Peter's position and, and, and in the position of the other disciples as well. They had only been with Jesus for a little while. And they're still trying to figure out who this man Jesus really is. For the disciples, learning and accepting that Jesus is the anticipated Messiah was not something that was immediately clear to them. They had to spend time with him. They had to witness his signs and his miracles, and they had to fall under the authority of his teaching. Over time, things would become more clear. In fact, if we take a moment and look very quickly at the section of Matthew's gospel that directly precedes what we're studying this morning, in chapter 16, verse 13 and on, we'll see that Jesus spot checks his disciples. He asks them, who is it that you say that I am? And it's Peter that responds by saying, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And to that, Jesus responds by saying, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. At this point in Jesus' ministry, his disciples are beginning to understand that he is, in fact, the promised Messiah, but they don't yet fully know what that means. Peter and the other disciples were brought up in a, in a Palestinian Jewish culture, and their understanding of who the Messiah would be and what the, Messiah, what the Messiah would accomplish and how the Messiah would go about accomplishing it was informed by rabbinic and Judaic tradition. And even the most popular assumptions of how the Messiah would overcome the ruling powers and authorities of the day typically did not include suffering on the part of the Messiah. Most assumed that the, that the Messiah would be a conqueror and not a sufferer. So while Peter in his mind had begun to understand that Jesus was indeed this promised Messiah, he still didn't fully understand what that meant. So he responds to Jesus in rebuke, and Jesus recognizes what's happening and immediately stops it in its tracks. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. 
We do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And I think this is one of the most powerful portraits of how evil can manifest itself that we find throughout, throughout Scripture. Because not long before this, Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, this same Peter was blessed by Jesus for his faithful confession. And then Jesus went on to explain to Peter and to the other disciples about the critical role that Peter was going to play in advancing Christ's mission on earth. And then just, just like a flash in the night, we were reminded that Peter, faithful as he was, was still subject to the impact of sin and the influence of Satan's work. And it's not at all that, that Peter became Satan. It's that Satan himself saw an opportunity and he took it. In that moment, Peter, who otherwise was a friend and follower of Jesus, became Satan's useful idiot. And Jesus points out how. Jesus points out that Peter did not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Every time a person focuses on merely human concerns, pushing aside the concerns of God, it presents an opportunity for the evil one to interject. And remember that Jesus has had this conversation with the devil before. As his public ministry was beginning, he was led, remember, into the wilderness by Satan, and he was tempted in three ways. And one of the ways in which Jesus was tempted was very similar to the exchange that we see here with Peter. We read back in Matthew chapter 4, we see that the, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, the devil said, if you will bow down and worship me. Satan was at that time, and he is also in our passage this morning, offering a shortcut. He was imploring Jesus to be concerned with the things of the world and not the things of God. In the wilderness, Satan was offering all the principalities and all the lands of the world as though they were actually his to give if Jesus would just bow down before him. No life of ministry, no signs, no miracles, no suffering, no crucifixion, just subservience to the evil one. Why suffer when there's a much easier and much more comfortable path? Similarly, Peter's rebuke to Christ's foretelling of his suffering again undermined the divine plan of righteousness that the Father had planned out for the Son. The suggestion that the Messiah could accomplish his task apart from the design and the will of God the Father is perhaps one of the most prime examples of not being concerned with the things of God and instead being concerned with things that are merely human. The thought that we can buy our own salvation is perhaps the most human thing a person can think. The temptation to avoid suffering and to pursue personal comfort was and is today very real as is the temptation to focus on ourselves with our concerns rather than the concerns of God. And friends, Satan is always looking for the next useful idiot. I'm not sure if you're as familiar with this term. I'd heard it once or twice before, and, and before I, I looked up its origin in, in preparing for today's message, I thought it was attributed to Vladimir Lenin and some propaganda stuff from before World War, World War II. It actually turns out it's from the mid-18th century um, from, from British political journals when it first appeared. And, and since its origin, the term has been used to describe someone who's generally pretty naive, someone uh, who is unwittingly used or, or manipulated to advance some type of propaganda or some incorrect belief or ideology. A useful idiot typically doesn't know what they're actually doing. And more often than not, once their useful idiocy is complete, the person is disregarded. One might even say that Satan's first useful idiot was the serpent in the Garden of Eden, whom he used to convince the first people that God didn't actually know what was best. Instead, they could rely on their own wisdom. And he used Peter in a very similar way, convincing Peter that what Jesus has said about his own suffering doesn't have to be correct. There's another more comfortable path to salvation that doesn't invo involve a suffering Messiah. And friends, there were, there were countless useful idiots in between the serpent and Peter, and friends, there have been countless of useful idiots since. And what do they all have in common? Their minds are not set on the concerns of God, but merely on human concerns. 
And the church has not been immune to this folly. There certainly have been those in the church, even leaders in the church, whose focus has been on human concerns. And when this has occurred, the devil waits in hiding like a snake in the grass. Now, as some of you may already be aware, uh, 2024 is an election year in the United States. If you weren't already aware, heads up, 2024 is an election year in the United States. And as this year progresses, we're going to become more and more acutely aware that 2024 is an election year in the United States. There are going to be reports and speeches and debates and a never-ending stream of commercials and cable news commentaries. And it's going to become increasingly difficult to parse through all the information and separate the wheat from the chaff. And though it may seem like the two major political parties in the United States are largely at odds with each other, and certainly in many ways they are, there are two ways in which the parties are strikingly similar. First, both parties are going to explain how theirs is the party that is going to make your life more comfortable. And second, both parties are concerned with, exclusively concerned with, human concerns, and not with the concerns of God. Indeed, the candidates that Americans will be voting for are being charged with handling human concerns. That, that's the office into which they are going to be elected. They are going to govern over us and establish laws and policies that pursue justice and that encourage human thriving, both at the local and at the national levels. The Apostle Paul reminds us in the 13th chapter to his letter, of his letter to the Romans that everyone, everyone is subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves." Now, this tells us two things. First, God has ordained that there should be governing structures to handle the human concerns of our daily lives, which means God has ordained it, and so it's good. Second, outcomes of elections, even the outcomes that we find most, most personally unpalatable, are under God's control and are subject to His determinations for His own purposes. So inasmuch as our elected officials are able to make our lives more comfortable or inasmuch as our elected officials are able to reduce the amount of suffering that we see in our nation, uh, then for each of those things we should be thankful to God himself because he has ordained it and has brought, about it, uh, has brought it about for his own purposes. And so if the outcome of any given election increases our prosperity or increases our job satisfaction, or increases our wages and earnings, or makes health care more accessible or affordable, if the outcome of any election makes us more comfortable, then praise God for His goodness and mercy toward us. And, and, not but, but and. And if an election turns out in a way that we consider unfavorable, then praise God for His goodness and mercy toward us because He has ordained it and has brought it about for His own purposes. And friends, make no mistake, this election, any election, and any subsequent outcome or, or level of comfort or level of satisfaction, these things have absolutely no bearing on your spiritual condition. These things have absolutely no bearing on what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. There are no clauses for different political groups, for different ethnicities, for different social classes. In this sense, discipleship is the great equalizer, not democracy. It does not matter if you're rich or poor or Republican or Democrat or independent or, or uneducated or educated. If you want to follow Jesus, you must deny yourself. You have to take up your cross and follow him. But, but, you say, but there are, but there are clear advantages to one party over another. But, you say, the, the other party represents a clear and present danger to me and to my family. 
But, you say, this is a must-win, no-fail election, and all of American democracy hangs in the balance. And folks, right now, both major political parties are saying that exact same thing. But Christian, beware. Beware of this type of hyper-focus on the concerns of man. Because remember that the devil is hiding like a snake in the grass. And he is ready to offer Christians a deal. He's ready to say that we can have safety and prosperity and comfort and American democracy. And all we have to do, the only thing we have to do, is compromise our faith just a little bit. All, all we have to do is, is compromise our convictions just, just, a, just a touch. All we have to do is allow just a little bit of wiggle room on those spiritual issues. And all we have to do is, is adopt some of the principles of the world. All you have to do, the devil will say, is focus on yourself, your own preferences, and your own well-being. He'll try to convince us that, that we don't need to suffer, that there's no need to bear a cross as Jesus did. All we have to do is vote one way or vote the other way, and we'll be able to have everything that we want. And remember, it's hard to think about the things you need when you have everything you could possibly want. But friends, Satan doesn't care about your vote. He doesn't want your vote. He wants your soul. Jesus asked his disciples, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And <laughs> These are fair questions. And I wonder if anyone here has given them much thought recently. Is there a price for your soul? Our Heavenly Father would say yes. A very costly price. And one that he is very intimately familiar with. Another good question as we roll into the season is, what is it, Christian, that we actually want? Do we want to win an election? Or do we want to follow Jesus? And indeed, there will be some who will say that those two things are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Maybe some will say that it's possible to win an election and follow the path of Christ. And, and why do you need to choose one or the other, they will ask. And there, there will be some churches, even in evangelical circles, that will spend the rest of 2024 trying to reconcile winning an election and following Jesus. They will say that not only are those two things not mutually exclusive, but rather they are quite complementary. And if you happen to come across a church that is doing something like this, I want you to pay close attention to the content of the message that is offered there. Because without exception, these churches will veer further and further from the truth that's found in the biblical text. And they will rely instead on their own earthly wisdom. Sermons will focus less on the person of Jesus Christ, who he is, what he has done, and what he has promised, and will instead focus more on influencing the political thoughts of the population. And as the church veers further and further from the Word of God, and as the content of the Word gets more and more watered down, inevitably you will see a change in the language that that church uses when interacting with its local community. You will see these churches borrow language from the culture and appropriate the standards of the world in an effort to make that church appear to be more approachable or more relatable or more politically or culturally relevant. Churches will abandon a faithfully exhorted gospel and favor instead kitschy catchphrases. And I, th I think you know the kind of catchphrases that I'm talking about. You've heard them before. Phrases that sound Bible-like. Phrases like, God helps those who help themselves, right? God helps those who help themselves. You've heard this phrase before. It was about uh, 15 years ago. I think it was uh, Christianity Today uh, did a study on the most popular Bible verses in American evangelicalism. And it turned out that 35% of American evangelicals noted that God helps those who help themselves was among their most favorite Bible passages. The only problem is... It's not a Bible passage. It's not found anywhere in the biblical text, not even close. But it's short. It's kitschy. It's self-helpy. And it echoes of the moralistic therapeutic deism that became so popular in the last part of the 20th century. But this is what happens when the word gets watered down. 
Another phrase maybe you've heard that again echoes of a, of a pseudo-moralism uh, that's also appropriating the standards of the world that the church has used to, to reconfigure folks' thinking. I'm, I'm sure you've heard this one too, is modest is hottest. Have you heard this phrase, modest is hottest? It's a phrase that's often uh, aimed at young people to, to try and encourage them to think very carefully about the ways they comport themselves, the language they use, the way they, the way they dress, modest is hottest. Now, some of you might even be thinking right now, well, hang on a sec, I kind of like that one. Modest is hottest simply isn't true. It's a lie. Hottest is hottest. Modest isn't hottest. Hottest is hottest. That's why it's called the hottest. All right, you still with me? Modest isn't hottest. Hottest is hottest because it's the hottest. It is what it is. Modest is is godly. Why does the church feel that we need to borrow the language of the world to make the message of the gospel more palatable to those whose hearts we are trying to change? Modest isn't hottest. Hottest is hottest, and that doesn't matter. Modest is godly. We don't need to adopt the ways of the world in an attempt to reconcile the commands of Jesus with popular worldly opinion. The, world, the word of the Lord, rather, stands on its own as the single guiding light, the single source of wisdom and instruction that keeps followers of Jesus oriented toward the concerns of God rather than the concerns of man. And while it's always a challenge for churches to remain engaged in the world and to communicate the, with the world and, and to do so without com, uh, compromising the authoritative content of the word of God, we may find that it will be particularly challenging during this election season. Challenging, but not hopeless. So I'll close with some words from J. Gresham Machen, who writes on this, that there is no room in the Christian life for despair. Only our hopefulness should not be found on the sand. It should be founded solely upon the precious promises of God. All men should return in these trying days with new earnestness to study the Word of God. If the Word of God be heeded, the Christian battle will be fought with both love and with faithfulness. Party passions and personal animosities will be put away. But on the other hand, even angels from heaven will be rejected if they preach a gospel different from that of the blessed gospel of the cross. Every man must decide upon which side he will stand. God grant that we may decide aright. It's almost as if he could have written this stuff two weeks ago. Dear friends, our challenge is great. Uh, not only are we a people in exile, which we are going to learn more about when God willing, Pastor Hammond returns, but we face the double challenge of being exiles who are off, also super comfortable. But there are no shortcuts, despite the temptations. The path that we are going to take will require sacrifice, self-deprivation. But there is hope for the believer. There is a path that has been trailblazed by the greatest of pathfinders. And there is a promise that at the end of our burden bearing, at the end of our taking up our crosses, there is a salvation purchased by Christ through the burden that he bore. So are you ready to take up your cross and follow him? Father, we ask that you would guide us, that you would give us strength, that you would give us clarity of mind, clarity of spirit, that you would give us, particularly this year, particularly as the vitriol and attitudes and anxieties over elections increase, that you would bless us with a peace that passes all understanding. And that when others around us, our brothers and sisters, our co workers, our friends, and yes, Lord, even our enemies, when they see us, they will see the particular goodness that comes from following your path. We thank you for that which you have accomplished through Jesus, that which we could not accomplish ourselves. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen.